Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is uh, March 1st, 2015. St. John's is located 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Telephone number is 937-323-7508. Um, if you brave the weather today, we've got about five inches of snow so far. Uh, very small congregation today. But uh, we're happy you've joined us on uh, YouTube for our uh, service. Pastor John Pollock is, uh, will be doing the service. Greg Nolte is our organist. Uh, today is communion.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. be doing the first reading. Yeah. 
o'clock, you go to bed, it's going to really be 3 o'clock, you're not going to get as much sleep before you have to get up for church, so you may want to go to bed at 6, 7, or 8 o'clock so you can not lose that entire sleep you're going to lose. So next Saturday is that horrible time moving the clocks ahead one hour, so please remember to do so. We are now going to sing We Are Baptizing Christ Jesus, hymn number 451, in the back of your worship. Give number 450. Jesus 
uh, or we begin the gospel lesson with Jesus talking about what is going to happen to him in the future. We've already read about how Jesus asked his disciples who people said he was, and they answered John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, Jesus said, uh, praises Peter for that confession and says that it comes from the Holy Spirit. So then when we pick it up, Jesus is talking about how he's going to be betrayed, how he's going to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, the scribes, and by the people, and how he's going to suffer and die. St. Peter doesn't like hearing this. Because St. Peter, in his mind, has his vision of what Jesus' role and mission is. St. Peter has in his mind the idea of how wonderful things can be if Jesus will just use his power in the way that St. Peter thinks he ought to use it. And so Peter begins to criticize Jesus and blame him. Like, what are you being such a negative Nelly for? What do you mean you're going to suffer and die? You've got all this power. It's, you have control over the seas and the wind. You have control over demons, you have control over illness, you can do whatever you want. And Jesus, of course, says to him, get behind me, Satan, because your mind's not on the things of God, but on the things of man. And how often is that true in our relationship with God? That we want to focus on the things of the world, we want to focus on those things we want, instead of listening to what God is telling us to do. Instead of listening to what God is telling us is the true way to live, the right way to live, the correct way to live, or the correct way to handle a certain situation. We want to use our rationale. We want to use our intellect. We want to use our feelings. We want to use what we think. But all the while, we're reminded that as followers of Jesus Christ, our minds are to be on the things of God, not the things of the world. And then we come to what all this leads up to. To the words of Jesus in that 34th verse when he says, If anyone would come after me, he's talking about discipleship, the cost of discipleship. What does it mean to follow Jesus? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. That word deny, deny is a verb form that means it's a once for all action. You do it once and, and then, then your rest of your life is guided that way. Uh, the word also means to disregard yourself or to lose sight of yourself. Now this command as Jesus gives it is not a legalistic command. It is not a command trying to keep you from enjoying life, but it is a command of love. Because if you deny yourself and follow Jesus, you're going to live life to the fullest the way God intended. But then he comes to those words that we don't understand the impact. And what it was like for that crowd to hear these words. Next he says, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross. Now in our day and time, we live when the cross is a symbol of victory. We live in a culture in which we know that the cross is a sign of triumph. The cross is a symbol of Christ's victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. For us, the cross is salvation. But it wasn't that way back in the first century A.D. In the first century A.D., the cross was a symbol of shame. The cross was a symbol of humiliation. The cross was a symbol of Roman domination. No one wanted to take up their cross. In fact, people tried to be as far away from a cross as possible. The cross was Rome's most savage way executing those whom they had judged worthy of such a death. Thieves, murderers, those who made rebellions against Caesar, treason, those who committed treason. The cross was the punishment. And the reason the condemned person was made to carry their cross to the place of execution was this symbolized that now this person who had rebelled against Rome, whether it be as being a thief, a murderer, committing treason, or actually leading a rebellion, they were carrying their own cross symbolized that now they were having to submit to the domination of Rome. And what made it more shameful and humiliating was you were having to carry the method of your execution to your place of execution. The normal ways that people are executed 
would hang and didn't carry the rope, the noose to the gallows to be strung up with. Those who were beheaded did not bring the axe or the sword with it for the executioner to use. Those being burned at the stake did not bring the torch so that the wood could be lit. In our own nation, those who were sentenced to death by the gas chamber, the old gas chamber, didn't carry the pellets that mixed with the water in order to make the deadly gas. They didn't carry them in their hands and give them to the executioner. But Rome didn't made you do this because it was part of that humiliation and shame and embarrassment. Here you're carrying your tool of execution to the spot where you were be And when, so when these person, people hear Jesus say to take up their cross, I am sure there was a loud gasp about that crowd. They knew what the cross was. They were chained <coughs> under the domination of Rome. They had seen far too many of their fellow Jews crucified on Gagatha day after day, week after week, year after year. The last thing they wanted was to pick up a cross. So what does Jesus mean? What does Jesus mean when he tells us we're to pick, take up our cross and follow him? That we are to lift it up and carry it. Well, the first thing I will tell you is what he doesn't mean. And this is where we enter into that subject of incorrect interpretation. Because crucifixion is not carried out in this country, and because crucifixion is not carried out in most countries in the world, except for Pakistan and the ISIS, only two of them that I know of, because the cross has lost that fear, many Christians read this and think, well, Jesus is talking about bearing the cross, meaning bearing the hardships of life. Bearing some kind of physical ailment. Bearing some kind of emotional ailment. Bearing some kind of economic misfortune. Bearing some kind of job misfortune. Bearing some kind of family misfortune. You hear people say, oh, the Lord has put such a cross on me that this burden, this, this asthma that I have, and it makes it difficult every day. Jesus is not talking about the hardships of life that come about due to sin in the world. Think back to Genesis when God created the world, everything was good. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, there were allergies. There weren't science problems. There weren't asthma, COPD. There wasn't heart problems. There weren't liver problems. There weren't cancers of any kind. Everything was perfect. God had made it to be perfect. Then Adam and Eve disobey, giving in to the temptation of Satan, and sin comes into the world, and sin tarnishes everything. Sin tarnished our bodies, making our bodies now susceptible to those things that plague us, that in the garden were not even present. Sin causes us to have emotional problems or concerns. It causes us to have financial problems. It causes us to have economic problems. It causes nations to go to war with each other. It causes people to do violence to other people. It's all sin. So Jesus is not talking about you having to bear up with something that has happened, some hardship in your life. No, when Jesus says to pick up your cross and follow me, he is talking about the willingness to bear the shame, the exclusion, the ridicule, the persecution, or even death for being a follower of him. When he says, take up your cross and follow me, he is talking about the willingness to stand before a mob and admit you are a Christian. He is saying that you as his follower are willing to proclaim him as Lord no matter how hostile an environment you might be in. There was a time in our society in which people 
were not ashamed to admit that they were a follower of Jesus Christ. There was a time in our society where it was not considered strange to be at some event and somebody to ask us to stand up and pray. From history, we know that it was not unusual for George Washington during the Revolutionary War to drop to his knees and pray to God for guidance and direction. We know from the writings of Abraham Lincoln that he tells us oftentimes he spent hours in prayer asking for God's guidance and direction during that great conflict of the war between the states and the enormous responsibility of being president of this, at that time, divided nation. When Charles Lindbergh made his famous solo flight from America to Paris at Yankee Stadium during a ball game while the flight was taking place, the announcement came over the PA asking everyone to stand up and for the next two minutes to pray for the success of Charles Lindbergh, and it was not considered unusual. It was not considered something that somebody needed to go run to the ACLU and whine about. It wasn't considered a violation of separation of church and state. It was figured, it was considered the normal thing to do as a Christian majority in this nation. A survivor of the Bataan Death March was asked if he prayed during that ordeal. And his response was, I think everybody prayed then. See, this is what Jesus is talking about. Being in public situations or difficult situations and not being afraid to acknowledge him as Lord. <clears throat> to not be embarrassed to say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. To not be embarrassed to admit that you're a Christian, even in a hostile environment. During the days of Britain's rule over the country or nation of India, there was a rich Hindu who began to worry about what would happen to him when he died. And of course, with the British occupation or administration of the country, he had heard about Jesus Christ here and there. He'd heard about Christianity. So he decided he would go to England and there find out what this Christianity was all about and, and who was this Jesus Christ. The family. So being a wealthy Indian, well, he, knew he was introduced to a lot of powerful people in London, a lot of influential people, a lot of rich people. One night he was invited to a fancy dinner. So as he was there at his dinner and eating, he turned to his neighbor and he asked, he said, can you tell me about this Jesus Christ and your Christian faith? person looked at him and said, oh, sir, we don't discuss such things at a dinner like this, and don't you bring it up anymore, because if you do, you won't be invited to another such dinner. Several days later, he was invited to a fancy ball. So he's out on the dance floor with his beautiful young English lady, and they're dancing to the music, and he asked her, he says, can you tell me about your Jesus Christ, the founder of your faith? And again, this him, they said, oh, sir, such topics are not brought up at a ball. So you shouldn't even ask that women in a place like this. To which the Hindu replied, this England is a very strange country. You claim to believe in a Jesus Christ and follow a Christian faith, yet none of you will tell me about it. So this is what Jesus is talking about this morning. When he's talking about taking up the cross, he's talking about risking the shame, the ridicule, the exclusion for a minute you are a follower of Jesus Christ. That you are willing to say, I am a believer even when you are in the most hostile environments. In northern Syria, in northern Iraq, on the beach in Libya, we see our brothers and sisters in Christ doing just this. In the face of the brutality of ISIS, we see those brothers and sisters in Christ clinging to the cross of Christ, admitting they are a Christian and dying for the faith. On the Orthodox Network, if you want to look it up, I think it's orthodox.net, I believe this is the way, proper way to find it. They had a report on those 21 Coptic Christians slaughtered on the beach in Libya. And they had listened to the video. 
21 Christian men as they were being butchered each said Jesus help me. Jesus come to me. Jesus take me. And they said Jesus help me. They weren't asking for help out of the situation. They were asking Jesus to help them remain strong in the face of their death so they could be a witness to Jesus Christ. That is taking up your cross. The early church father, Tertullian, said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. <laughs> and that is how the church spread throughout the Roman Empire. Through the blood of the martyrs and the proclamation of the gospel. And hopefully with the blood of the martyrs in Iraq and Syria and on the beaches of Libya, it will cause the church to grow in those areas as people see these people picking up their cross shame to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. So when Jesus says to take up his cross, he is telling us that to be a servant of Christ is to be one who is willing to take on the shame of being a Christian when you're in a situation that people think it is shame. It is a servant of Christ is one who is willing to put up with the ridicule to being excluded from fancy balls or fancy dinners or whatever because he will not <laughs> submerge your Christian faith in order to gain some kind of earthly honor. So it should once again be a society in which it is not uncommon for us to gather together and pray for our country in different circumstances, not just in church, but at a ball game, or a fair, or a political event, or whatever we may, wherever we may be. Jesus is calling us to not be ashamed of our faith. He took away the shame of the cross. By his dying on the cross, paying the debt of sin that we owe, paying, ransoming his blood for our life, paying his blood to ransom our life. He took away the shame of the cross. So that for us, as I said at the beginning, the cross is now a symbol of victory. And so with it as a symbol of victory, we should not be ashamed to lift it high to proclaim our faith in Jesus Christ, no matter how hostile the environment. And so be that servant of Christ. Take up the cross and be willing to proclaim Jesus even in the most hostile of environments. And you will be your <coughs> disciple. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Turn to page five in your worship bulletin. And again, I invite those who came with that difficulty to please stand. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not not many, of one being with the Father. Through him all things remain. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate with the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified in a conscious God. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. 
who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we journey through this season of repentance and renewal, let us turn to God who mercifully gives us new life. Our response today is, your mercy is great. God Almighty, the promises you give to us rest on your grace, not on our deeds. Like Abraham and Sarah, help us to trust in your word and believe in your faithfulness. Hear us, O God, your, your mercy is great. O God, you have given birth to a multitude of nations. Guide their leaders with peacemaking hearts and lead them always in honesty and justice. Hear us, O God, your, your mercy is great. great. Bless all who serve those who are unemployed or homeless. Strengthen those who care for the sick, that they might see your work in their lives. Hear us, O God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Guide all who lead in the worship of this congregation, musicians and artists, lectors and ushers, assisting ministers and altar guilds, that by their ministry we will be enabled to set our minds on holy things. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Challenge us, O God, to see beyond ourselves and to know that we are surrounded always by a great cloud of witnesses, all of our dearly departed. Hear us, O God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Merciful God, hear our cry when we call to you. Renew and oppose with your spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be <coughs> Turn our hearts. 
hearts towards those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care and prepare us now for the feast of the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. We now continue our worship with a great thanksgiving on page 6 in your worship book. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and light. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son to proclaim the good news in word and deed, it was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all the drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant, my blood shed for you for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ is, is died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. Christ, Christ will, will come again. again. Therefore, O God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord and offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to show us the great and promised feast. Amen. Amen. Come, Come, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Sit now and pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in love. Amen. Come, Come Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Join our prayer for those of your servants in every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who Lord art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, and his precious blood strengthen and preserve you in true faith and the life eternal. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God who loved us with his bread of life and cup of salvation, you united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. We conclude our celebration with my hope is built on nothing less in number 596 in the back of the room. In number 596. today at uh, St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio, uh, for braving the weather coming out, uh, worshipers that were at church. Uh, you can watch all of our services on YouTube. We have them uploaded usually by the day after the service. Uh, Wednesday night, midweek service, Lenten service at 7 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the afternoon, a 6 o'clock meal. Preceding the 7 o'clock service is served. We have uh, four more Wednesday evening services before Easter. Uh, the Lenten meditations will be on the seven last words of Christ from the cross. Again, thank you for joining our service today. Uh, St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. 
telephone number 937-323-7508.